This episode of Health Gig is part of the Evolution series powered by Paragon. We are working with Paragon Performance Evolution to bring you a special series of incredible speakers which have been hand-selected from their network to be our guests on Health Gig. Paragon works with companies to bring in authors and thought leaders who can help implement hands-on programs which focus on transformation, integration, and greater awareness. They blend the best of modern science, human behavior, and timeless wisdom into all of their programs, which is why we are so supportive of the work they are doing in this world. We are thrilled to be collaborating with Paragon Performance Evolution for this very special series and so happy to bring these conversations to you. Hi, this is Doro. Just a quick reminder before we get to our guest today that the Achieving Optimal Health Conference is on Saturday, October 3rd. Due to the pandemic, this year, the conference will be held virtually, and all are welcome to join. You'll be inspired by luminaries in health and wellness and take home real strategies to improve your happiness and wellness. You can get all the information you need at AchievingOptimalHealthConference.com. And now for the show. People are yearning for information. Having the opportunity to encourage people and to educate people and inspire people. It's amazing to be able to say we'll carve out time to take care of ourselves. There's something for everyone. Our guests today, Jeff Benton and Brett Weinroth, are the founders of Paragon, a company to help people live and work with a deeper sense of meaning using modern science and timeless wisdom. Jeff and Brett are a dynamic team who are doing transformational work, and we are so happy to welcome Jeff and Brett to Health Gig. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Great to be with you today. We, first of all, want to hear about Paragon and what is it and what's the inspiration behind it and how is it going? The inspiration, I think for both of us and for me, started as a small child. I have a father who is a sports agent and represented some of the most prolific professional athletes in the world. So I was always really fascinated by what made those professional athletes different and the ability to perform at a higher level, you know, including Arthur Ashe and Michael Jordan and Jimmy Connors. Also an inspiration for starting the company was my own personal story. It was really around wanting to succeed by society's norms of having the great job and making money and looking really pretty on paper. And I think that when I got to that point and I had the jobs I always dreamed of and I continue to progress, I continually had an increased sense of the imposter syndrome, and I was being driven by fear, anxiety, a little bit of anger. I ended up going through a family tragedy, and actually my mom took her life, and I hit rock bottom, and it changed my complete perspective. I actually ended up having sort of a panic attack and finally letting go, and at that point, I really had a tough time grasping reality and trying to figure out why we're here. So I went on my own journey, really traveled the world and met with brain scientists and took a much more spiritual route, meeting with monks and shamans. And I realized after a few years of actually focusing more on the internal process, I was happier than ever. Health problems went away. I ended up having deeper relationships with family and friends that I'd known for 20 years. I'd had deeper relationships in the last few years. And what I realized was if I could have that transformation from the fear, the anxiety, the imposter syndrome, to going into a state of gratitude, really operating more from a place of love than fear, that anybody could do it. We were fortunate our company was representing a lot of CEO organizations, a lot of professional athletes, a lot of creative types. Again, that looked really pretty on paper, checked all the boxes, but these individuals were having conversations with us that they were miserable and they didn't really understand what their purpose was. So through Brad and I's sort of own journey and my own story, I realized for us to truly impact the world and change the world, because we lived in the corporate world and kind of looked like it and smelled like it, you know, we had an opportunity to change corporate leaders and they had so much influence over so many people. So we created Paragon really as this high performance leadership company and a little bit of a Trojan horse to shift consciousness of these individuals, knowing if we could shift the consciousness of these CEOs and high performers, 
they had so much impact on so many other people that it was one way that we could really contribute to the world in a much more positive way. Before we get to Brett, I want to ask you a question. I know what anxiety is firsthand, but what is imposter syndrome? The imposter syndrome was, as I kept evolving to bigger titles and more money and looking to be successful on paper, I inside felt like I didn't deserve it. And it was still probably the voices of myself as a child, just in that space that I'm not good enough because I was so focused on the external. And I also think growing up in the sports entertainment world and being an athlete, there really was very little space to process at an internal level to even understand this stuff. So it was just like, how do we keep moving forward? How do I keep moving forward? So as I kept sort of evolving, there was this sense that I didn't deserve it or that I was fooling the world. And again, it was a very external lens. And I think there was a long time where I felt like if I actually was going to do internal work, I would just cry or go crazy. <laughs> like I was so scared of my emotions at the time. So it was a deep process. Brett and I just got off a, we lead a global meditation and we had a diverse group of community and one of our friends that was a police officer and having very open and honest conversation. and. It's been very intense. I live in Santa Monica and there's been a lot of intensity of emotions. And one of the things I'm thankful for through going through this journey is five years ago or even 10 years ago, I was so focused on the external. I was so scared of the unknown. And I think with this internal journey, it's really forced me to understand who I am at a deeper level and what my values are and seeing myself just beyond the constructs of society around money and title, it's allowed for me to move forward in a way that I could have never moved forward in the past with this uncertainty and defining myself differently so that our company and myself individually could be of service and have actually the confidence to put together different groups, to have conversations, meditations, anything and everything to actually contribute in a more positive way. What is your elevator pitch for your new company? Can you give that to us? I mean, I would say, you know, Paragon Performance Evolution, we are strategic advisors. We are conduits and a resource for helping CEOs, business owners, and senior executives develop high performance and leadership programs. And it's really about helping them enable not only themselves to show up, as their best selves, but also, as Jeff mentioned, influencing the people that work for them or that they represent and doing it in a way that they're really coming from their truths. And so for us, you know, we've been really fortunate to align with some world-class practitioners and thought leaders and subject experts who actually come in and help us implement the programs that we'll develop for our clients. And as Jeff mentioned, we've spent years working with companies helping them to develop partnerships and strategies for growth within their companies, whether it's their brand or their IP or their teams or what have you. And we've learned along the way that the real work starts with the human being that we're in contact with. And if we could shift the way that our clients were showing up every day, it would allow us to help them tell their story better. That passion for human behavior, which I think is really the core of where Paragon comes from, it's our own collective curiosity and passion for helping people be their best. And it starts with ourselves. I mean, we are our own laboratory and the journeys that we've each gone through as individuals. But really for us to be able to help these companies develop programs that shift the way that their leaders and their teams are operating on a day-to-day -day basis. Because at the end of the day, we all want to wake up and feel a sense of joy and meaning and flow. And mm -hmm. if we can play a role in helping these company leaders find programs and solutions to do that, we feel like we're making a really big difference in their lives. We go in and we audit company's culture. We work with their CEO, their chief people officer, and then we put a plan together. But what's also unique is we've been fortunate to be around all these high performers and these expert resources for 20, 25 years. So we actually will bring in resources as a part of that that are part of the Paragon team. So, you know, we have Nobel Prize nominees, 
it's a really impressive group, really. It's more than just checking the boxes around the leadership stuff. Our resources really want to create transformational change, and mm-hmm. they've been doing it at a global level. You know, if it's around conflict resolution, communication, innovation, mindfulness, creativity, that's been sort of unique to our business model. What does a leader look like to you all? And what kind of leaders do you think we should see? And how are the leadership changing now in this world that's so different? Lots of questions there. (laughs) Yeah, it's a great question, Tricia. I mean, as Jeff said, I think for us as leaders, getting to a place where we recognize that it starts from the internal, it starts from inside each of us, as opposed to waiting for external forces to dictate what our behavior is going to be like. And I think for leaders, particularly in today's world where there's a lot of confusion, There's a lot of uncertainty and CEOs, business owners, senior executives who maybe in the past thought they had all the answers are now facing a time and a place where they're searching for those answers and people are looking to them for answers. We feel like being in the present moment, really living from your heart, really telling your truth and understanding that we can control so many things. You know, we can control how we show up every day. We can control the way we focus. We can control the way we breathe, our mindset. We know that there are things that we can't control. And once we get to a place where we can acknowledge that, then the real work starts. And so I think in today's world, particularly over these past 11 or 12 weeks, helping company leaders embrace self-care and knowing that if they're first starting with themselves, you know, that's going to help them sustain and be resilient through the turbulent days and hours that we're facing during this pandemic and troubling times. And then also being focused on team care. You know, how do we show up to support one another through this challenging time? And so those are some of the ways that we're helping company leaders kind of focus their attention as far as the work that we're doing with them. What we're seeing more than ever is the leaders that are vulnerable and creating a safe space for their employees and their culture to be able to share are having the most success, right? Because so much corporate culture is spent on thinking about what's my boss thinking about the more of the politics and the more you can sort of decompress that culture and get people into their hearts. I mean, not only is it probably the right thing to do from a personal standpoint, but it frees up energy for people to actually perform at a higher level. And I think the second thing is we're all intuitive beings with a lot of the leaders, if they're saying one thing, but then they're showing up in a more controlling, fear-based mode, people know that. Like Brett said, as we've done our own work of getting more real and sort of acknowledging what's going on, the world has responded to that in a positive way. You know, as we work with our CEO clients to dig into their own stuff, it's amazing sort of how the universe conspires with them to support that. YPO has been a client for a long time, and they have created something called forums within their different chapters. And this has been an inspiration for us and a little bit of a microcosm to the greater world. With forums, they create this safe space to share about personal and professional challenges. With the leaders today, there's very few sort of spaces they can share. You know, sometimes they can't even share with their family, their friends, their board of directors. So to be able to create these safe spaces, right, to share allows for them to decompress and get perspective and know they're not alone. So we're actually creating forum programs with that spirit of having that safe haven, that confidential environment, because it really allows the CEOs and high performers to free up that energy. So forum is where people gather like-minded people within the company, are you saying, or are they just outside the company? We've done it within companies that create this with leadership teams. And then we've also done it where we've brought groups of leaders together that are not within the same company Mm -hmm. and having these like-minded individuals. We've actually done it with professional athletes and some other groups. It's been very cathartic for these individuals. It's been a great learning experience. They tend to look 10 years younger when they leave these forums. So, And it's a safe haven where they can feel comfortable, as Jeff mentioned, sharing information they may not do in a normal social setting. This kind of approach is something that we have done both in full form and also in bits and pieces with clients where getting them to set intentions at the beginning of strategy meetings with their teams or with us, having them share maybe kind of the 5% that is the best happening in their life and the 5% that's most challenging in their life, you know, with a smaller group. 
setting some commitments for follow-up meetings. And it's been amazing to see clients that we've worked with over the years kind of transformed their thinking as they've taken that approach and they become better people and better leaders as a result of it. If I were a leader in the community coming to Paragon, walk me through the steps of your method. Well, I think the first thing is to take you through a diagnostic session. We have been you know, developing our own skills as business executives for 25 years and helping to uncover companies' challenges. Some of it is now transitioning to the individual and the individual's challenges within the context of their business. So I think the first thing is to uncover what's going on. Where is the struggle? Where are you running into roadblocks, either emotionally or mentally or within the business? And once we can help that leader get to a point where they feel comfortable, he or she starts to open up about their business, then we can really help them diagnose and then almost prescribe. And once we have a really good sense of, I've got discourse within my leadership team, I've got you know, multiple generations that we're trying to get onto the same sheet of music in a seamless way. I've got ex-military mixed with civilian, whatever the case might be in each company, every company's story is different. And for us, it's really being very thoughtful and methodic in helping them to uncover what the challenges are that they're facing. So I think once we're able to do that, then we can start to think about the types of programs that are gonna become impactful for them. And then also start to help them identify what practitioners, what Paragon resources might make the most sense, which practitioners will fit within their culture. We've got an amazing leadership guru in Ray Jefferson, who is a decorated veteran, West Point undergrad, two MBAs at Harvard, White House fellow. I mean, his resume goes on and on. We know that his personality is gonna fit for certain types of companies. But part of the advantage that a company has working with us is we have already done the vetting of these resources. As Jeff mentioned, they're either close friends, leaders that we've gone through the programs that they run. And so we have a really good feel once we understand where the company is looking to improve or what challenges they're looking to overcome in terms of matching them with the type of program that can hopefully get them on the journey towards a better culture, better relationships, you know, more compassion amongst their team, more focus from their team leaders on helping advance kind of the next generation of leaders within the company, whatever the case might be. Making the world a better place is really important to you guys, right? So by approaching it this way, is that how you see your work changing the world? Yeah, absolutely. And just to continue on what Brett was saying, you know, we do an exercise with our clients to define the higher purpose of the company. One, we just think that's important for people to see themselves beyond just profit. And also it connects the employees, their clients, their vendors, their partners in a whole different way. But we also have the CEO and the C-level team do it on an individual basis so that they really understand what they stand for and that it helps them within their decision-making with everything. So it's around their integrity, their value, who they are sort of beyond that specific role as CEO. And mm -hmm. we find that is really important because then in tough times, they can go back to something that was, we would say would be their higher self, right? To be able to make decisions. And we think that's so important because when people don't have that ability to find themselves from that, that's when they get into trouble and they make decisions from maybe ego and greed. So we really, really push on that. Also, like, you know, we'd said before, our team and our resources, it's more than just checking the box, right? Doing these leadership programs, they truly want to transform the world. So even though on paper, they're Nobel Prize nominees, they're Harvard, they're lead negotiator for the FBI, there's a deeper connection to what their work is sort of every minute that they're processing. So that's why we say high performance is a really nice word for increased consciousness and awareness. But we just feel like with the world we're in today, you know, we have so much knowledge, but obviously we can do better by having the corporate world, which has the most power, right? That's where we think we can make the biggest contribution. In the short time that you've been doing this work, have you seen shifts? I mean, does it happen fast to people or is it a process? Obviously, it, look, it's a process. It was interesting because I took part in a client experience a couple of weeks ago with one of our resources. It was a self-care program. There were a number of different levels of staff on the call from the CEO to the chief people officer on down to account managers and some younger folks. And at the beginning of the call, there was a lot of expression of certainly gratitude that the company was allowing this team to come together and 
hopefully experience some techniques to transform the way that they were feeling and thinking. There was also a lot of overwhelm and stress and exhaustion just from the work from home experience, the blurred line of when does my home life start versus my work life. And within two and a half hours of this session, this group's, their faces, their eyes were lit up. To say completely transformed is probably a little strong, but the energy from the collective group was significant. What's great is that our experts, our resources have the ability to shift the way people are feeling and thinking in a moment's notice. And we're seeing this with our heart math meditation technique, but we know that the work needs to be sustained, right? And we know that companies, if they're going to make real change at a human level, at a leadership level as a group, these are techniques that have to be adopted. And I think they say that habits are formed over a period of 35 to 65 days, depending on what it is. And so we know that if the company is committed to helping shift and transform their teams, that it's something that they're going to want to do on a more frequent basis. It's not something that you can just cure with a pill, obviously. Can you talk a little bit about heart math and how it influenced you? Yeah, so thank you for the question about heart math. It's been extremely impactful in my life. And it's really a tool in human technology that improves our overall emotional well being. Heart math really teaches us how to change our heart rhythm patterns that then allows for us to create something called physical coherence. This physical coherence is literally a scientifically measurable state characterized by like increased order and harmony in the mind with our emotions and our body. The thing I love the most about it and is what's most incredible is when we enter into this state of coherence, science is showing us that others around us start to match our level of this coherent state. You know, what Brett and I always are so amazed at and we try to practice is that we truly are all alchemists and have the ability to shift others in a positive way. You know, Heart Mass really been around for 25 years and it's peer-reviewed, evidence-based research. They've worked with 9,000 clinicians, specifically even just from the physical standpoint. It helps with significant improvements in blood pressure hypertension, you know, with the autonomic nervous system, mental clarity, immune system, decreasing inflammation. You know, they're working with hundreds of medical centers around the world from Harvard to Stanford to the Mayo Clinic. It's really an amazing tool. And I would just say if any of your listeners want to learn more about it, you know, I'd love to even just lead them through a, a quick heart math meditation. How does this program work in socioeconomic disparities? Is it still as effective for everybody in different areas? It's really interesting because we just had this conversation an hour ago. On this global meditation, we have members from a number of different communities. We are all scared of the unknown, right? Especially now more than ever. And so when we live in the past or the future, that is when the cortisol kicks in, our health gets affected. So with the heart math technique, when we get into the heart and we're feeling the heartbeat and we're doing the breathing and we're feeling the gratitude, it allows for us to access a present state. So even if we're going into a challenging situation five minutes from now, the next day, whatever, we are in a much healthier physiological state to then go in and we end up having a greater level of acceptance of that situation than when we're in the past or future creating stories. And so it's really across the board with heart math. I mean, they work with everybody from nurses to gold medal athletes to the Dalai Lama. It really works in all situations. So I guess what I'm saying is, does it work if people aren't privileged? Absolutely. It still gets them into that state of presence and acceptance to deal whatever their challenges are. They're just in a more optimal state to deal with those challenging situations. When you talked about the socioeconomic and the increased stress, right, because of that, where heart math has had its biggest impact is training SWAT teams before they're going into life and death situations, training doctors and ER nurses, right? Because a high percentage of deaths and mistakes are because somebody is not present. They didn't necessarily need to happen, but it was somebody that was tired because of stress. They weren't thinking clearly, and it just keeps bringing you back to that present moment. That's so cool. 
It is amazing. And when Jeff first turned me on to HeartMath, I happened to be on a client trip in Northern California, and he encouraged me to go visit with one of their senior directors at their headquarters in Brentwood City, California. And I spent about an hour and a half with Robert Browning. We had a coffee in this little town there. And after I left, I had this visceral emotional reaction that I had never experienced before. And I called Jeff and I said, what is going on here in Brentwood City, California? Like he must have been in such a high coherent state. His vibration or however they want to measure it was so high that I could literally feel it. And we used to talk about having the ability to go into client meetings. We might have a client that would be in a high stress mindset to actually slow our own breath down, which would then hopefully the energetics would impact the client and we could start to see the shift. It was amazing mm -hmm. stuff. And as I started to study more and more about this and practice it myself, it became apparent that the heart has obviously beyond beating and sending blood through our system, it has its own kind of brain in the way it controls our stress response and everything else physiologically that's impacted. They've done several studies, even when a dog is hyped up or an animal and you somebody's doing heart math and getting into that state of coherence, they show the animal starts to measure the heartbeat of the owner or whatever the experiment is. You know, there's been amazing studies also around meditation. They would go to a certain city and where there was a certain amount of folks meditating, they would see crime drop. And then they started to experiment. They did some in the Middle East where it was like, could we actually influence war and destruction. It's nice that science gets behind it. So much of what we believe the mystics and sages were saying thousands of years ago that we're just energy, right? How we exist internally provides the external lens to the world, right? From the Buddhist to the Vedic teachings. And now it's been really beautiful and interesting that the scientists are actually catching up to prove all of this and the quantum physicist. So we are our own creators. And I think in a time where we might not have the same leadership, it's maybe the greater message is we all are our own leaders and our own creators. The heart math and the meditation and the other things that we bring to our clients and that you two are doing are really the way of the master, right? There's no more waiting for the savior. It's like, how do we do the work to move forward? So these ideas and concepts that you all present to your leaders, I mean, Trisha and I are so familiar with what you're talking about. It's things that we've studied, things that we believe in, but how new is this information to your clients? And is there a learning curve that makes it difficult or how does that go? What we've learned is to stop overthinking that our clients are going to think we're crazy. We try to go into experiential mode right away. And so an example of that is we'll take our clients through heart math. Instead of them judging in whatever, we have them go through the experience right away. And once they experience it, it's an immediate shift with the forum program where we create a safe haven where they'll be like, nobody's going to share. And we actually have them go through it right away because our brains get us in trouble. But the minute we actually experience a shift, then to have that experience, we end up creating a deeper belief system in what it is. A lot of our clients are done operating the way they have been operating, right? With having this facade of having to uphold a certain image because it's exhausting. The human nature in all of us is we want to operate at a more truthful, loving level. And so I think when we come in and talk the way we do and we're vulnerable about our own story, it really allows a freedom for them to open up and share at a deeper level. And as mm -hmm. they feel that and the things that release, then they are more open to us doing these programs for them individually and as a team. A lot of it starts with the trusting relationship that we can have these open conversations. And maybe it's because Jeff and I are officially now middle age, having turned 50 this year, that kind of our own epiphanies have allowed <laughs> us to share with friends and colleagues. The good news is we're in an incredible moment in time where mindfulness has become even more mainstream than it's ever been, as you all certainly know with your business. The fact that science is now supporting the benefits of meditation, of mindful behavior, of all the things that we are practicing ourselves every day, and we're seeing incredible results from. I mean, I've got teenage kids, and the most important thing for me 
is to be my true self so that I can be the best parent possible and to set the best example. And if I were to revert back to that time in my late twenties, early thirties, where I tried to show up as someone that maybe I wasn't to impress people or whatever the case might've been, it wouldn't allow me to really share in an open way with people that are close to me, with clients. And as Jeff said, as we're having these conversations, more and more people seem to be opening up. It's almost like they were waiting for someone to ask the question. And then it just flows like water from that point. It becomes this very open and honest conversation that then leads to, all right, let's kind of dig into what you as an individual might be challenged with. And then let's start to think about it in the context of your business. But my gosh, I mean, there's so many incredible tools out there, apps that lead guided meditations and wonderful books. And, you know, we have video at our disposal every day and people just have a wealth of tools and content available. I think for us, it's really taking a lot of these programs and philosophies and customizing it down so that for our clients, they know that they're on a path to success because there is so much information and part of it is sifting through a lot of the noise, if you will, and finding the right set of solutions that is good for their business. It is wonderful. I just was listening to an interview the other day with the Dalai Lama that Richie Davidson was kind of interpreting and you know the work that he's been doing since you know, 40 years, the fact that it's finally come this far and he's able to help bridge kind of the Eastern and the Western, it's incredibly valuable for us living in today's day and age. Say it's like five years down the road. What do you guys hope is different? What do you want to see different from the work that you guys are doing right now? I think that there continues to be more conscious leadership where we're not defining shareholder value as number one and the profits, because through that, we're literally destroying our planet. We're putting dollars above everything, including people. And I think we're headed towards not a good path that way. So it's really having people operate from their hearts and from a higher consciousness and from a high place of integrity and really being able to be their true selves at all times. Like we're here having this human experience, whatever this is. And it's not to just work 60 hours a week and make money. There's something much deeper going on. So it's really tapping into more of the human side of each person, more of the divinity, having people lead from there because then naturally positive things happen from that, right? From how they treat themselves, respect themselves, and then they treat their teams. That's a big thing having these high performance leadership consciousness programs really being at the forefront when they're doing strategy and when they're thinking about their culture versus sort of a check the box that they think they should have them because of either pressure from society or whatever it is. It's incredible work, really incredible. Thank you. You guys are doing the great work. <laughs> <laughs> we ask all of our guests what book they think everyone should read. Well, I love The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho. It's one you of took my mine. all-time favorites. <laughs> Doro, I want to go first. It was one of the first books that my son had to read when he went into high school four years ago. And so to be able to have shared that experience, and my wife read it when he was reading it, to me, it's something I keep on my nightstand. I pick it up from time to time just to read a passage here or there. But the concept that the universe is constantly conspiring to help you reach your goals and your dreams, I'm just an incredible fan of that work. Work. All right. You're allowed to have the same one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Doro. For the book, there's many, but since Brett stole my favorite one, I would say another favorite book is by Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now. When he talks about getting into that present moment, it was really impactful, right? Because so much of our pain and our stress and our challenges are tied to us thinking about the past or the future. It was the first time when I'm reading that book that I moved past understanding that an intellectual level and feeling it at a visceral level, in that present moment, in that stillness, truly all is possible. It's almost like that zero point energy before the big bang. And as we can remain in that place, we can actually remain in our heart in a place of love because the fear kicks in in the past or the future. And so feeling that deep state of presence allows for us to truly be who we are and show up fully present at all times. The power of now. Brett gave me an assist there, but thank you. <laughs> there you go. Do you have a favorite quote? 
I'm a huge fan of John Wooden. I really wanted to be a basketball coach growing up and kind of started down that path. So Coach Wooden, for me, someone who has reached so much success through teaching and being of service is just an incredible role model. The quote that he has that stands out to me is about being more concerned with your character than with your reputation. You know, Jeff's earlier point about living from a place of non-judgment, you know, having the guts and kind of the fearlessness to press forward to chase your passion. I mean, for me, that's incredibly valuable. So I love that. There's a lot of quotes from Coach Wood, and that one in particular really sticks out. We need character more now than ever. Jeff, how about you? I love Thomas Merton. You know, he's a monk in this devotion to the higher self and to God, but he also had this very human existence. And I also like at the end of his life, like he was very open to other religions. He happened to be a mentor and a huge influencer of the Dalai Lama. And so one of my favorite quotes, if I could remember it, is we must make the choices that enable us to fulfill the deepest capacities of our real selves. In each moment, we have the opportunity to kind of rise above, right, and be our higher self. And that's a lot of the work we do, right? It's so much of how we define ourselves or how our clients define themselves becomes this guiding light and this compass in all situations. Because our society isn't necessarily promoting that or that's not a part of our culture, we find that when we actually have our clients define those higher goals and visions, it's so freeing for them because they get out of their own ego and their own constructs and have this guiding light to be their best selves. So again, when I read the Thomas Merton quote, that resonates right in the heart for me. Well, it was such a pleasure to have you guys on Health Gig and Trisha, you can speak for yourself, but we both thank you for being here. Very much. The pleasure is, is ours. We are incredibly grateful for this opportunity and thank you so much for having us. You both are inspirations and we typically are always promoting our amazing resources. So thank you for allowing us to tell our own story and we're excited for our new friendship with you. Thank you both. Thank you for joining us on Health Gig. We loved having you with us. We hope you'll tune in again next week. In the meantime, be sure to like and subscribe to this podcast and follow us on healthgigpod.com. I'm Trisha. And I'm Doral. Be well.